All right, welcome back to Phlebotomy Solutions video presentation, how to pass the exam, what you need to know before taking the phlebotomy exam. Let's start with the 10 tips to pass the exam. Number one, understand the basics. Ensure you have a solid understanding of basic phlebotomy concepts, such as types of blood tests, order of draw, and vein location. Number two, review safety protocols. Familiarize yourself with all safety procedures, including infection control, personal protective equipment, such as PPE, and proper disposal of sharps. Also, practice technique. If possible, practice drawing blood to improve your technique. This could be on a mannequin or through video practice sessions. Number four, study anatomy and physiology. Focus on the circulatory system, understanding the veins used for venipuncture and the composition of blood. Number five, learn the equipment. Know the different types of needles, tubes, and tourniquets and understand their specific uses. Number six, understand patient care. Learn about patient interaction, how to explain procedures to patients, and how to handle anxious and difficult patients. Number seven, memorize the order of draw. This is crucial to avoid cross-contamination and ensure accurate test results. Number eight, review common diseases. Understanding conditions that affect venipunctures like hematoma or phlebitis can be helpful. Number nine, take practice exams. Use practice tests to familiarize yourself with the format of the exam and types of questions you might encounter. And number 10, stay calm and focused. During the exam, take deep breaths, read each question carefully, and don't rush your answers. Now let's discuss some critical thinking skills that you need to develop. Critical thinking and the ability to eliminate wrong answers are invaluable skills for successfully passing the phlebotomy exam. Here's how they can be particularly beneficial. Improving understanding of concepts. Critical thinking involves analyzing and evaluating information rather than just memorizing it. This deeper understanding can help you apply concepts to different scenarios, which is often required in exams. Identifying key information in questions. Sometimes exam questions may contain extra information that isn't relevant to the answer. Critical thinking helps you identify the most important parts of the question or a question, allowing you to focus on what's truly being asked. Analyzing potential answers. In multiple choice exams, some answers may be obviously incorrect, or there might be two very similar options. Critical thinking enables you to analyze each option and assess its validity in relation to the question. Eliminating incorrect answers. If you're unsure about the correct answer, eliminating the obviously wrong answers can increase your chances of choosing the right one. This process of elimination is a strategic approach to handling difficult questions. And avoid overthinking. While critical thinking involves deep thought, it also includes knowing when not to overanalyze. This can prevent second guessing yourself on questions where your initial instinct was likely correct. Managing time efficiently. By quickly eliminating wrong answers, you can answer questions more efficiently, managing your time better during the exam. Handling anxiety. Sometimes anxiety can cloud judgment. Critical thinking helps in maintaining focus and clarity even under stress. Remember, the phlebotomy exam tests not only your knowledge, but also your ability to apply this knowledge in various contexts. Practicing critical thinking and elimination techniques can greatly enhance your exam performance. So let's now go over some critical thinking examples using the methods we just suggested. Question one, you need to draw blood from a patient who has a history of being a difficult stick. 
which vein is generally considered the best second choice if the median cubital vein is not accessible? A, cephalic vein, B, basilic vein, C, dorsal venous network of the hand, or D, external jungular vein? What is the answer? You should answer A, cephalic vein, but why? Let's go through some process of elimination. D, external jugular vein, should already be eliminated immediately because that is out of the scope of the practice of the phlebotomist and should never be attempted. Dorsal venous network of the hand, C. We always go to the hand after the three major veins located in the anticubital fossa area or the bend of the elbow have been eliminated. So we know the median cubital is not accessible and you should know by the order of veins that the basilic vein is always the last vein to be attempted. So you are left with a cephalic vein. Now this is critical because we use the process of elimination using critical thinking methods and going through each answer and looking at the question carefully, which says the best second choice. So we now go through our process of elimination that we just used and, and read about, and we utilize it in this question. Now let's take a look at question two. If a patient has a seizure during a blood draw, what is the first action you should take? A, continue the draw and quickly finish. B, remove the needle and activate the emergency response system. C, apply pressure to the draw site immediately, or D, try to hold the patient still and prevent injury. So what is the answer? The answer is B, remove the needle and activate the emergency response system. But why? Again, looking at the question carefully and using process of elimination, considering the order of the answers helps. We know that we should never try to hold the patient still to prevent injury while the patient is going into seizure and we should never continue the draw and quickly finish while the patient is having a seizure. And A and C, apply pressure to the draw site immediately is applicable, but only after we have removed the needle and activated the emergency response system. So even though we've gone through the process of elimination, B and C could be together the right answer, but since it is separated, we now go to the order of the correct answer, which is first to remove the needle and activate the emergency response system. And then we can go back and apply pressure to the draw site immediately to make sure the patient doesn't bleed out. Now let's take a look at question three. Which of the following is the correct order of draw for blood collection tubes? A, EDTA tube, sterile tube, heparin tube, citrate tube, B, sterile tube, citrate tube, heparin tube, EDTA tube. C, citrate tube, sterile tube, EDTA tube, heparin tube. Or D, heparin tube, citrate tube, sterile tube, EDTA tube. What is the answer? The answer is B. Why? Because if you know the order of draw by the additives and not just by the color, you'll be able to make a distinction between blood cultures, sterile tubes, with everything else after. The first tubes in the order of draw will always be blood cultures or sterile tubes prior to any other tube. Therefore, if you can learn the first few tubes and their additives in the proper order, using the process of elimination and reading each additive carefully can help you get to the right answer. In this case, your sterile tube precedes the citrate tube, then your heparin, and then your EDTA. And again, these answers are based on the additives and not the color of the tubes. Now let's take a look at question four. A patient is scheduled for a fasting blood test. They inform you that they, should, that they just had a cup of black coffee. How should you proceed? A, proceed with the blood draw as coffee won't affect the test. B, delay the test and inform the patient to return after 12 hours of fasting. C, draw the blood and note the coffee intake on the specimen. Or D, reschedule the test for another day. What is the answer? The answer is B, delay the test and inform the patient to return after 12 hours of fasting. But why? 
because you know automatically that black coffee will affect the test since this is a fasting blood test. So A is immediately eliminated and with that also C, you should never draw the blood and note the coffee intake because the patient will still have to come back for another blood draw because again, coffee will affect the test. Now D and B are possible answers together, but since they're separated, you never want to reschedule the test for another day until you ask the patient if they can return after 12 hours of fasting. That's the first. If the patient is not able to, then you would reschedule a test for another day and notify the doctor. But B would be the primary first choice of asking the patient to return. Then if they're unable to, D would then go on to be the answer of rescheduling the test for another day. So always use critical thinking to eliminate the answers and work through the answers of what should be done with the patient when dealing with these types of questions. Now let's take a look at question five. When performing a venipuncture, what is the maximum amount of time a tourniquet should be left on a patient's arm? A, one minute, B, two minutes, C, three minutes, D, five minutes. What is the answer? A, one minute. A tourniquet should not be left on a patient's arm longer than one minute. Again, the question is, what is the maximum amount of time? That is the time that's allowed on leaving a tourniquet, the maximum amount of time given. It's not five minutes and it should never be three or even two minutes. You should know that it's one minute is the maximum amount of time. And this question could be confusing based on the word maximum amount. But carefully look through the question, read it carefully, and understand that the tourniquet on a patient's arm should, no, should be left on no longer than one minute. Now we do have other videos on this, on tourniquet application and in our skill videos for venipunctures. Make sure you review them so that you familiarize yourself with this type of question. One minute is the maximum amount. So again, critical thinking, looking through the questions and answers, and trying to utilize what the question is saying and applying them to the answers and then doing process of elimination will typically get you to the right answers every time. So here's my final point. Remember, consistent study and practice are key to passing the phlebotomy exam. So good luck. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them here. We'll be glad to help you with anything you need. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel with all of our videos that will help you through your phlebotomy exam and help you through your phlebotomy program classes. So thank you and have a wonderful day.